what I say. In other words, listen to what I'm saying. By the way, we then will turn to the oath sacrifice of Agamemnon and the return of Briseis. And the interesting question, because he promises with the slitting of the throat of an animal, he promises that, in fact, he never touched Briseis in any way. Um, and, and I'm not going to read all of this, but I will raise this question. How about this? If there is no belief in the gods, right? By whom or what, then, do you swear to as a promise? I mean, just, just to kind of think about that. Notice, by Zeus, he says, I, I make my promise or whatever, uh, by Zeus. And then um, um, it, it will be uh, it will be then that we're all we're all ready for our you know cutting of the boar's throat and all of that kind of stuff, right? Um, finally, we have the return of Briseis at line three thirty five, and this is such an amazing passage. When Briseis, the girl who was stolen and given to Achilles and then stolen by Agamemnon, she has been the pawn throughout this entire thing. She was there at the beginning, but not there at the beginning, and we've never ever heard a word from her. Now finally, she gets a few lines. And look at what she says. Compelling. So Briseis returned like golden Aphrodite, but when she saw Patroclus lying torn by the bronze, she flung herself on his body, gave a piercing cry, and with both hands clawing deep in her breasts, her soft throat and lovely face, she sobbed, a woman like a goddess in her grief. She cries, and she says, Patroclus, dearest joy of my heart, my harrowed, broken heart, I left you alive that day, I left these shelters. Now I come back to find you fallen, captain of armies. So grief gives way to grief. My life, one endless sorrow. Think about how all of the women in the Iliad can say one endless sorrow. The husband to whom my father and noble mother gave me, I saw him torn by the sharp bronze before our city. Achilles kills all of her family. My three brothers, a single mother bore us. My brothers, how I loved you. You all went down to death on the same day. But you, Patroclus, you would not let me weep. Not when the swift Achilles cut my husband down. Not when he plundered the lordly mighty city. Not even weep. No. Again and again you vowed you'd make me godlike Achilles' lawful wedded wife. You would sail me west to your war in your warships home to Pythia. And there with the Myrmidons hold my marriage feast. So now I mourn your death. I will never stop. You are always kind. This is a remarkable passage for a number of reasons. And I wish I could get into it more. I just don't have the time to think about what she says. She says, I really lament the fact that Patroclus is dead because he was such a good guy to me. Because he wouldn't let me grieve over the fact that Achilles killed my family and my husband. Because Patroclus promised he would make an arrangement so Achilles would marry me. And for that, Briseis seems to feel like that's a fair trade. It is, of course, really obscene that this kind of thing is accepted as understood within Greek culture. Well, of course Briseis would be pleased. She gets Achilles, after all. Everything we've learned about Achilles seems to suggest who would want to be married to this guy in the first place. But that's the beauty of the Iliad. It shows us all sides. Like, for example, it shows us the side of Achilles and his grieving. We think here of, of St. Augustine in Confessions 4. Obviously, St. Augustine knew these lines well. When St. Augustine lost his best friend and writes, powerfully, passionately about losing a pal. I've given those lectures in Harvard Classics if you want to take a look. As he looked at Patroclus, the dead body, we're told at 370, the memory swept over him, sighs he from his, de from his depths as Achilles burst forth. And now we have Achilles' prayer to Patroclus, powerful. Oh God, time and again, my doom, my dearest friend, you would sit before us a seasoned meal yourself here in our tents in your quick and expert way when our guy forces rush to fight the Trojans, stampeding those breakers of horses into rout. And now you lie before me, hacked to pieces here, while the heart within me fasts from food and drink, though stores inside are full. We reminded that Patroclus is sitting listening quietly in Book 9 as Achilles is approached by the embassy and Achilles is singing his song. And then a little bit later it will be Patroclus who serves the food. And Achilles says, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm just blown away by all the memories of all the things that you did for me, right? He says it. I'm sick with longing for you. There is no more shattering blow that I could suffer. Not even if I should learn of my own father's death, who this moment is weeping warm tears in Pythia. I know it. Bereft of a son as loved as this. And here I am in a distant land fighting Trojans. And all for that 
blood chilling horror Helen wow so in other words now we're going to blame we're going to blame Helen for all of this right I mean what Menelaus had nothing to do with it Paris had nothing to do with it or the death of my dear son whoa we're going to hear about Achilles has a son reared from me in Skyros if Prince Neoptolemus is still among the living Prince Neoptolemus is mentioned Prince Neoptolemus will be the one who kills the killer of his father right that is to say Paris will shoot Achilles in the ankle and Achilles will die. Neoptolemus will be the one that ultimately will have something to do with the conclusion of all of this, right, um, uh, at the end. Uh, there's, there's different stories about the death of, of, of Paris and how that one all works out. That's certainly one of those stories, right? Um, there, there's, there's as well uh, the idea that maybe it's Hercules' son that in the end is the one responsible for it. Till now, he says, I had hoped, hoped with all my heart that I alone would die far from the stallion land of Argos here in Troy. But you, Patroclus, would journey back to Pythia, and then you'd ferry Neoptolemus home, fast in your black ship, and show him all my wealth. That's interesting that that's what he cared about, that his boy would see all of, that, all of Achilles' teammate. My serving men, my great house with a high vaulting roof. For, Father, I fear he's not dead and buried yet. Type thinking now about, about his, his own son, uh, Peleus. Just cleans... We, we heard about this, right, in, in, when Thetis, when Thetis was, uh, was saying to Hephaestus in Book 18, line 508, My husband has gotten old and he's, and he's near death. To his last breath, grown down, ground down by the hateful siege of years, waiting day after day for painful news of me until he learns his only son is dead. So this is the grieving that is a part of Achilles for his pal. Powerful stuff, ironic stuff, obviously, as well. Zeus then is watching, and so the next movement is for Zeus to turn to Athena and say at line 405 or so, My child, to Athena, have you abandoned Achilles forever? Your favorite man of war is all lost now. No more care for Achilles left inside your heart. There he huddles before his curved beaked ships, racked with grief for his dear friend, while others scatter, settling down to their meal. He's fasting, never fed. Go. Run and instill some nectar and sweet ambrosia deep within his breast. Stave off his hunger now. By the way, uh, uh, Achilles is only going to have a small handful of people around him. We're told the two Iaxes, Phinox, Nestor, uh, Odysseus is there. Interestingly absent always in the inner circle of Achilles is Menelaus and Diomedes. We don't see either of those two um, in, in, you know, in, these kinds of, uh, in these kinds of meetings. Um, well, this is exactly what Athena does. She goes. She she gives the uh, she gives um, Achilles some some um, ambrosia and nectar to, to to sustain him. And now we are ready for um, Achilles's aristia. In other words, the getting ready for the battle itself. And this is how Book 19 will end. We begin at line three uh, 430, and we have a series of events which very nicely will describe for us the different things that you do when you get ready to go out for the fight, right? Uh, first, we're told, you got the graves the, the, that will protect the legs. Then you've got the breastplate. Then you've got the sword. Then you've got that major massive shield, we're told, that, um, uh, that was made fashion for it in the last book. Then you've got the helmet. So much has been made of helmets in the Iliad, hasn't it, right? Then you've got the test. Brilliant Achilles, we're told at line 453, tested himself in all his gear, spun on his heels to see if it fitted tightly, see if his shining land, uh, limbs ran free within it, and then you have the word, yes. And it felt like buoyant wings lifting the great captain. Last, we're told about the shield. Uh, I'm sorry, the spear. Peleus, his dad's she, um, spear. Nobody else can lift it. Remember when Patroclus goes off to fight in Achilles' armor. He leaves the, shield, uh, the spear there. We're going to see more of this spear a little bit later in the Iliad, right? Finally, after all of that, you've got the war team. That is to say, the ponies themselves. We're told at line 470, Achilles struck his stance, helmed for battle now, glittering his armor like the sun astride the skies. His ringing, daunting voice commanding his father's horses, Roman beauty and charger, illustrious foes of Lightfoot. Try hard. Do better this time. Bring your charioteer back home alive to his waiting Argive comrades once we're through with fighting. Don't leave Achilles there on the battlefield as you left Patroclus. 
day. <laughs> In other words, I hope it's almost as if Achilles is blaming the ponies for the death of Patroclus. He wouldn't have died if you guys could have done a better job of bringing him back. Roan beauty, we're told. The horse, with flashing hooves, spoke up from under the yoke, bowing his head low, so his full name came streaming down the yoke pads, down along the yoke to sweep the ground. The white-haired goddess Hera gave him voice. Yes. We're back to the word yes from earlier. We will save your life, this time too, master, mighty Achilles. But the day of death already hovers near, and we are not to blame. But a great God is, we're back to the blame game again, and the strong force of fate, not through our want of speed or any lack of care did the Trojans strip the armor off Patroclus' back. It was all that matchless God, slick-haired Leto's son, Apollo. He killed him among the champions and handed Hector glory. Our team could race with the rush of the west wind, the strongest, swiftest blast on earth, men say. Still, you are doomed to die by force, Achilles, cut down by a deathless god and mortal man. Paris, while not being mentioned at the end of the Iliad, is here all the time. Every time Achilles is reminded, like here, you're soon to die. It's really a mention of Paris. The, the, the pony said no more to finish the book. The fury struck him dumb. But the fiery runner Achilles burst out in anger. Why, Rome beauty? Why prophesy my doom? Don't waste your breath. I know, well I know, I am destined to die here, far from my dear father, far from mother. But all the same, I will never stop till I drive the Trojans to their bloody fill of war. And then we're told it. A high stabbing cry, and out in the front ranks he drove his plunging stallions. I'll pause for a moment and just show you the relevance of the ways in which this all works together. In Book 18, we had in line, at line 667, thou um, dirge of the dying year is the line that's mentioned there. And uh, this one will sound familiar later when we study the great romantic poet, uh, Percy Bysshe Shelley. And it's in a poem called Ode to the West Wind, which is referenced at line 491. I just want to point out the ways in which this poem has had such a profound influence in the history of all the poetry and writing that will follow. Well, let's jump quickly to two, uh, at level two and level three, as, as we are often want to do, right? Um, at level two A. Well, the blame game. We mentioned this already, right? No, none of the warriors ever seem to want to take full responsibility for their actions, and, and, and they blame it on the gods, right? Another major message here is, of course, the power of grief and rage. Achilles will forgive Agamemnon, but he's going to jack Hector, right? We also have mentioned it, so let's say it here. We could have, of course, done this in every one of these lectures. The role of women in the, in the Iliad, no question, they suffer the most through all of this, don't they, right? At 2B, the symbols will, in fact, be, in our case here in our study, the women. Notice, they're either scheming, like Hera, or they're pawns, like Briseis. Or they're both, like Helen. Note the message all the way through the Iliad is, though. Beware women, you men. They're very, they're very dangerous. They're always causing us to do naughty naughty, right? And at some point, you always wonder when somebody's going to stand up and say, what are you talking about? Briseis was taken as Achilles tore up her city and destroyed her family and then was given to Achilles as a sex slave. And now she's excited because she gets to be married to him? It's insane. It's absolutely insane. And yet, if this is going to be the text upon which we will build uh, Western culture, many have argued that, well, maybe this explains why there is that really confused understanding often about how guys see girls and girls see themselves from a poem like this, right? The irony, of course, as well mentioned it to be, is that when Achilles sees death, he's got no interest anymore in teammate whatsoever. Of course, as we said at 3A, very much like Scrooge and the story of the Christmas Carol, um, right? Um, the uh, other one, I, I mentioned it already, um, Shelley's Ode to the West Wind. The Romantics, let me just say this, because we're going to meet the Romantics later in AP English. The Romantics, they love the Iliad. Whitman, for example, we're told, even quoted lines from the Iliad as he walked next to the surf. Of course, at 3A, 
What about the blame game? And what texts come to mind here? I mentioned already Paradise Lost and Milk. We'll get to that one later. What is your favorite text, by the way, about talking animals, especially horses? For those of us who have read the Bible, we know the Numbers 22, 21 through 39 story of Balaam and his talking donkey, for example. you got a pony here who's basically going to lecture Achilles as well. At 3B, well, we started with this question of the blame game. Let's go there now. That this idea, stop asking when bad things happen, why did this happen to me? Where it's like a victim mentality, some, something out there doing some naughty nasties to me, and learn to ask, why is this happening for me? That is to say, you are in control of your own, of your own world. I'm reminded of that Dalai Lama story, the Dalai Lama telling about in their, in their attempts to leave uh, Tibet, the Chinese had captured one of the monks, and he got away, but he reported that the story was that the Chinese tortured him and broke most of the major bones in his body. And the Dalai Lama asked this monk about that, and his response was, throughout the entire thing, the only thing I worried about was that at some moment, I might begin to hate or dislike or not love my torture. So I prayed that I would not hate my tortures. Instead, I would pray for them. Well, this is compelling. This reminds us, of course, of what Christ said in uh, Luke 23, 34, right? On the cross, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Where do you come down on this very idea, right? When was the last time, for example, you learned through suffering? You suffered, but you learned through it. You were able to ask, why did this happen for me, right? What does it take to learn to ask the question, why did this happen for me? To take responsibility for your actions. Think about a time when you did take responsibility for your actions. Think about a time when you didn't, and you're looking back, you kind of wish maybe that you had. Instead of blaming it on someone else, right? How about this one? A time that pain or suffering taught you that teammate or stuff doesn't matter. Like Scrooge, right? We think here, of course, of Plato's cave allegory as well. We'll get to Plato later. But the idea of when you are able to be free from the darkness of the cave, you start to understand what really matters. We call this perspicacity. And we're going to ask this question, at what point in the Iliad, if at all, does Achilles ever come to true, genuine insight or perspicacity? Well, there you go. That's the 19th book of the Iliad. Now we get to watch in book 20. The gods are going to get involved. And Achilles is going to get ready to start killing a whole lot of people. The collateral damage is brutal. And it does beg the question, is it an over-response for Achilles to go out and just destroy so many Trojan lives because of the death of Patroclus? Go back to the lecture that I gave on Achilles' crisis of faith. I don't think it's just because he lost his best friend. I think it's because he is uncertain about what life means for him anymore. Well, come back and we'll uh, go to book with... Uh, go to work with book 20. Thank you.